service, but I hope it'll be a help and a blessing to us. Job chapter number 19. Find your text in Job and chapter number 19. And if you would, get the book of Hebrews in chapter 7. In the other hand, just put a tassel in that. Put a bookmark, a Bible marker, an ink pen. Put something over there. We'll go that way here in just a little while. Hebrews chapter 7 is where we'll go in a little bit. But I'd like to kick off and use Job chapter 19 as our, our springboard, our diving board off into the message this morning. Can I say there as a pastor, trying to figure out what the Lord would have me to feed the sheep and preach to his people and the sinners, sometimes it's kind of a um, hard thing to discern, but I like Resurrection Sunday. It's real easy to preach on the resurrection. I like preaching on the resurrection. I like telling people that Jesus is alive. I like telling people that the Lord Jesus is able to save them and change them. And I like preaching on that stuff. Uh, time doesn't permit to preach on it every service. There's a lot in this Bible, and I'm supposed to preach the whole counsel of God. But I sure do like it when the Lord lets me lie down and preach on these kind of texts this morning. You say, well, what in the world? Why are we the resurrection Sunday and we're in the oldest book of the Bible. Job, as far as when it was written, is the oldest book that was written in Scripture. Why are we here? Well, I, I'll say like Ernest T. Bass said to Barney and Andy about them rocks in that bag. I'm getting to that. I'm getting to that. <laughs> just hang on. We'll get there in just a minute. And we'll get to the resurrection Job chapter 19, we are firmly into the middle of this book and Job is pouring out his complaint before God, before his friends. And he's wondering what is going on and, and why all this is going on. Job has been persecuted by the devil. He has been uh, torn apart in his life. As a matter of fact, look down at what your Bible says. Job chapter 19 and verse number 8. Job chapter 19 verse 8. Job makes this statement. He, Job speaking about God. He hath fenced up my way that I cannot pass. In other words, he said, I feel like God has hemmed me in. And I can't get out of the trouble that I'm in. And he hath set darkness in my path. He said, I, there's no light on this. I don't understand why. I don't know which way to go. I don't know what to do. And watch what he says in verse 9. Verse 9, he's, he thinks God did this. He says, he hath stripped me of my glory and taken the crown from my head. Job says, I feel like I've been stripped of all the things that used to bring me comfort in my life. Those of you that know this story, and those of you that may not, let me bring you up to speed. We find that Job has been stripped of many things. Hang with me now, I'm headed somewhere. Job has been stripped of his fortune. In verse number 9, our text there, he said, He stripped me of my glory and taken my crown. In other words, my possessions, my monetary security... It's all gone. When you read about Job in Job chapter 1, we find, Brother Heath, that he's one of the greatest men among the men of the East. And he's got cattle and he's got camels and he's got sheep and he's got servants and he's got lands and he's got houses. And he is just wildly prosperous financially. And in one fell swoop, in one day, not over the course of a year, not over the course of 10 years, but in one day, we find, Brother Bill, that the messengers come and they say, well, the, the bandits, the Sabaeans, they've fallen upon the cattle and on your servants and they've taken it all away and it's just all gone and, and fire has even come down out of heaven and it's burned up the sheep and Job, all of your financial security, you're bankrupt, Job, you've got nothing. Job says, I have been strong stripped of my fortune. Job not only has been stripped of his fortune, he has been stripped of his family. In verse number 13, look at your text, verse 13, he says this, 
he hath put my brethren far from me. My acquaintance are verily estranged from me. My kinsfolk have failed. My familiar friends have forgotten me. They that dwell in mine house and my maids count me a stranger. I am an alien in their sight. Job says it's, it's not just my fortune that's been stripped. I've been stripped of my family. And we find that was true because all of Job's children, his seven sons and his three daughters, all ten of them were feasting and celebrating a birthday party party in the eldest brother's house and we find that the Bible said that a wind came from the wilderness and struck that house on all four corners and the house fell and killed the entire family I mean all of his youngins dead just like that and then we find his own wife turns against him in the darkest hour of his need brother CJ his wife turns against him and says why don't you just curse God and die and Job feels like it's all been stripped away and truly it kind of feels like it has this morning. Can I say, if you're in any trouble, if you're in any distress, if you're in any burden, you can take solace from the fact that it's probably not gotten to the point, or it's probably not gotten as bad as where Job is right now. Ten wooden crosses on the hillside, financial fortune gone. Then we find he said he's been stripped of his friends. Doesn't even have any friends. His own friends. Look at verse 19. Verse 19. Now hang with me. We're going somewhere. Verse 19, all my inward friends abhorred me, and they whom I loved are turned against me. And this is true to form, because we find, Brother Stockner, that his own friends are the ones that show up. All four of his friends, Bildad and Zophar, and, and all these guys, and Eliphaz, they all show up, and, and they, they, they ridicule Job. They don't show up to try and help him. They don't show up and say, man, we're praying for you. You know, that's a blessing. When you're in trouble, and you got issues, it's a blessing to have a friend, Brother Butch, that'll come along, send you a text, call you, come to your house, something, and say, I'm praying for you. I'm here for you. If you need me, call me. If you need me, text me. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on your side. But Job's got none of that. As a matter of fact, his friends are doing the opposite. His friends are saying, this is your fault. And if you've been living for God, this wouldn't happen. Job has seemingly been stripped of it all. Listen to me now. Job's been stripped of his fortune. Job's been stripped of his family. Job's been stripped of his friends. But mark this down. Job has not been stripped stripped of his faith y'all listen to me when you've been stripped of everything hang on to your faith this morning you might get stripped of your fortune don't let your faith go you might get stripped of your friends don't let your faith go you might get stripped of your family don't let your faith go the apostle Paul was the one who said this Paul had been stripped of fortune Paul had been stripped of family Paul had been stripped of friends but nevertheless in the latter part of his life he made this statement brother Bill he said I've fought a good fight I've finished my course I I have kept the faith. What is, what is the faith that helped Job? What is the faith that will help you and I in these days of turmoil, in these days when your world is turned upside down? Notice Job's faith. Watch what he says in verse 25. I love this. Verse 25. <laughs> For I know... I don't know a lot of things. He says, I feel like I'm in darkness. Said, I feel like I'm in darkness, so I don't know what's going on. Said, I feel like I've been fenced in. I can't get out, and I don't know how long this is going to go on, so I don't know that. He, he said, I feel like I've been stripped, and I don't know. Maybe God's going to strip me down some more, so I don't know about all that. But I know this much. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. <laughs> Job said, this is what's going to help me get through, Brother Steve. I know he's alive. 
He's listening. He's looking. He's loving. He's aware. He knows what's going. Can I just take a time out and enjoy my own preaching here for just a minute? I'm telling you in the darkest hours of your life when you feel like everything's been stripped away from you, uh, you can hang on to this faith. You can know for certainty this faith that my Redeemer lives. uh, Your Redeemer lives. That's what we're celebrating this morning. We're celebrating the fact that he sits on the throne, uh, that he enters seeds for you and I, that he is the great high priest of heaven, that he knows where we're at and he knows what we're going through. And I may not know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. And I may not know what tomorrow will bring, but I know who's going to bring the sun up in the morning. And I may not know what trouble may come, but I know there'll be grace to face every trouble and every trial because my Redeemer lives loves this morning yes he does yes he does in an upside down situation messed up Job I love this I love this brother Mike Udy Job makes the first hey hey in Sunday school or not Sunday school in the early service I preached on the scriptures declare the resurrection And talked about how all the way back over in Genesis chapter 2, there is a picture of the resurrection. But y'all, Job is the oldest book that anyone had ever written in the scripture. And in this oldest book of the Bible, Job is the first to declare the resurrection is real. (laughs) In the first book of the Bible, he said, I know he's alive. And I know one day I'm going to see him in my flesh. He said, even though I might die, I'm going to sit. There's going to be a resurrection for me, he even said one day. He upholds all things. Not a doubt in Job's mind. Job says, I know he's alive. I know he liveth. Not a doubt in Job's mind. Can I say there ain't a doubt in my mind either that Jesus is alive this morning. There's not a doubt in my mind, not a scintilla, not a shred of doubt in my mind that he's alive. You say, preacher, what gives you such confidence to think that Jesus is alive? Because the Bible says he upholds all things by the word of his power. Hey, listen to me. This morning the sun came up, Brother Garrett, who put the sun where it is. Hey, 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 if it were not for Jesus, if he was dead, the stars would fall out of their sockets. The moon would fail to give her light. The tide would not come in and out. Uh, The sparrows would not be fed. Uh, uh, You say, oh, I'm telling you, uh, uh, it's just a fallacy. I proved in Sunday school the resurrection of Jesus is real this morning. But the fact is, if he was dead, somebody show me a death certificate because I didn't see it. And if he is dead, I should have been notified because I am next of kin this morning. And ain't nobody told me I would have liked to have attended his funeral. I'd have liked to have stood over his casket. I'd have liked to have stood over and heard his eulogy. But he ain't dead. He's alive this morning. And I know for a fact my Redeemer lives this morning. So I'm interested in this word. Y'all I only got one shot today. Well I had the early one but I ain't got no shot to preach at you tonight. So I'm going to preach just a minute here to you. And we're going to go to the house. I'm interested in this word that's in verse 25. Notice the word. Verse 25, he said this. For I know that my Redeemer, this is my word, liveth. (laughs) Now y'all, hang with me here. I, I, I am no English major. But I got this much figured out, Brother Travis. He did not say, for I know that my Redeemer lived. No, I ain't what he said. He did not say, for I know that my Redeemer will live. That's not what he said. He said, Brother Mark, for I know my Redeemer liveth. You say, what is the liveth? <laughs> the word liveth means this. It is an active word. That means he was, he was alive back there. He'll be alive up there. But he's also alive right here. He says, I know my Redeemer is a living in the past. He's a living in the present. 
and he's a living in the future, and he liveth. So I want to preach just for a few minutes this morning on this subject, my Redeemer liveth. My Redeemer liveth. And because he is actively alive in the past, present, and future, what does that mean for us this morning? I mean, the Scripture's got to be here for our learning that we through comfort and expectation of the Scriptures might have hope. We, there's got to be something in it for us. What is the point of him being alive? Alpha, Omega, beginning, ending, first, last, was, is, is to come. What was the point of him liveth? What, what's the point of that? Let me show you three things and we'll go to the house. Go to Hebrews chapter 7 with me. Hebrews chapter 7. I would like to say firstly, number one, my Redeemer liveth for me. My Redeemer liveth for me. For those of you that are taking notes. My Redeemer liveth for me. Watch what your Bible said in Hebrews chapter 7 verse 22. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 22. If you found your place, say amen. Amen. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, speaking of Jesus, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Watch it. Here's our word. It's showing up. Verse 25. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth. Why is he living always? I I like that little phrase. I I, I want to tell you this before I read the last part of the text. The little phrase, he ever liveth, literally means this, Brother John Glenn. It means this. (laughs) This blessed me when I studied this out. It literally means this is his purpose for living. Because it's about to tell you what he ever liveth for. What's the point of him not just dying, but rising from the grave like we're celebrating today? What's the point of that? Why? Why didn't he just die, Brother Jeff, and leave it at that? What's the point of him ever living? Living on. What's the point of the resurrection? Here it is. My Redeemer liveth for me. Watch what it says. Seeing he ever liveth. Here's why. To make intercession for them. You say, what's the first thing you see about your Redeemer? I see my Redeemer liveth for me. He did not just die, Brother Blake. He got up. Why did he get up? Why does he live on? Because he knew I needed someone to bridge the gap between here and heaven. He knew that someone had to be a go-between between God and man. Y'all listen to me. Don't buy into the lie and the fallacy of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Listen to me, y'all. We're not reaching out toward God and God putting a finger down towards man. No, sir. The Bible said God is angry with the wicked every day. And the Bible said that man doesn't even want to seek God. They're running from God. They're shaking their fist in the face of God. I mean, I've talked about it in Sunday school, I think it was. And I'm not going to get political in the 11 o'clock hour in Easter. But I didn't start this fight. Somebody else did. So if they're going to start it, I might. Might as well throw a couple punches in it myself this morning, amen. I'm not the one, I'm not the one that self proclaimed March the 31st on Easter, National Transgender Day. That nursing home patient up there in the White House is the one that said that just yesterday. I'm telling you, you say, What is that? That's mankind shaking their fist in God's face, flaunting their sin, flaunting their unrighteousness in God's face, and daring God to do something about it. 
about it. That's what that is this morning. I'm telling you mankind is hopelessly separated from God. Mankind is hopelessly uh, uh, alienated from God. Man don't want nothing to do with God uh, and God looks down and sees man his sinful condition and can't have fellowship because he's holy and he's righteous and he's pure and he's God and so they can't come into contact but you hear me this morning there is somebody who lives uh, and whoever liveth and the reason why he lives uh, is to reach out and grab God's holy hand and reach down and grab man's uh, dirty sinful ungodly hand and bring them back into contact you say who is that that's the Jesus we're preaching about that's the Jesus the Bible talks about this morning I'm telling you he ever lives uh, to reach out and grab your hand and bring you back into a relationship and fellowship with God. Mankind has been separated from God all the way back since Genesis chapter number 3. Brother Mike, mankind sinned, walked away from God and they've been busted apart. But thank God on the cross, at the cross of Calvary and because of an empty tomb of the Savior of glory, the God man, the perfect man, the holy man, he he was all God, but he was all man. Perfect God and perfect man reached out and grabbed Cody Zorn's hand. Hallelujah. And reached up and grabbed God's hand and brought us back into fellowship this morning. Notice what your Bible said. Notice what your Bible said, who he is able to save. Did you notice who he's able to save? He said, wherefore is able to say them to the uttermost, watch this, that come unto God, don't miss this, by the baptismal pool. By church membership. By the Baptists. By being a good Roman Catholic. By confessing, taking the Mass and the Holy Eucharist, by keeping the Ten Commandments, by observing the Golden Rule, by being a good person, by working hard and paying your bills and being a kind-hearted soul and not doing evil to people. That's how he saves them. That is not what the Bible said how he saves people. Let me pause right here and say this. You can be the most sweetest, kind-heartedest, gifting, goodly person that tries to help little old ladies across the street donate your time and your money to shelters and to food drives and try and be a good person and join up with every organization and that's fine and well I ain't against that be, be a good person try and help people I believe as a Christian you ought to try and do good things for people I'm for that but if you think any of that is going to bring you in contact with the Holy God if you think any of that is going to save you from your sin and give you access to a place called heaven You've got another thing coming this morning. If you're trusting in your good works, if you're trusting in your self-righteousness, if you're trusting in what you can do this morning, you're just as good as in hell with your back broke this morning. But I'm glad the Bible said, Brother Parks, that he saves this kind of people, those who come to God by him, by him, by him. It's not what I can do. It's what Jesus did. It's not how I can work. It's it's how he worked. It's not my ability. It's his atonement. It's not my work. It's his redemption. And because he died for me, but he rose for me, he has the ability to save us if we come to God by him. People are looking for all kinds of ways. Come here, Brother Mike. I'm going to let you be something you probably ain't never been before. Jesus. Whoa. <laughs> I'm glad your wife ain't in here. She'd go into, she'd go into early labor right now because I called you that. <laughs> Here's the Lord Jesus. Come here, Bill. And over here's God. <laughs> That's a stretch, ain't it? <laughs> Boy, I'm really stretching text this morning. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> and here's what mankind tries to do. They want to get to God. They realize there's a God. Oh, there's a God. There's a creator. 
He made the stuff. He made the worlds. He made the planets. He made the, and, and I know I, you know, you hear, you hear him, all kind of lost people talk about, well, I need God's help. Well, I need, I need God's help. And they talk about God all day long. It's this guy they got a problem talking about. Ain't that right, Brother Tim? It's God this and God the other, and I'm all for that. But I'm telling you, you ain't getting to God unless you go through the mediator that God has set up. I didn't make it this way. God made it this way. I didn't set it up this way. God set it up this way. God sent a perfect Savior. God sent a perfect substitute. God sent his perfect son. And God said, if you want to get to me, this is, <laughs> this is the door. Jesus said, I am the door. Jesus said, I am not a way, not a good way, not one way among many ways. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no man cometh to the Father but by me. You sitting here this morning, you keep trying to get to God. Keep trying to get to God and you running around over here. The Bible said anybody who tries to come into the sheepfold except through the door, he's a thief and a robber. You keep trying to get to God and you can't never reach him because he's too holy and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and you can't never reach him because he's too high and he's too holy and you keep trying to get to God but you got no peace and you got no fulfillment and there's constantly a hole down in your heart and you can't figure out why and here's why. You keep slipping around with your good works. You keep slipping around trying to be a good person. You keep running around keeping the Ten Commandments. You keep joining church to church and you keep trying to reach God but you won't never, never, never never, never, never get to him because the way God saves is you got to come through Jesus and when a sinner comes to Christ, bows the knee, admits he's lost trusts what he did, then Christ reaches out and grabs God's hand and now I get an opportunity to have fellowship with God because I met Jesus. It's not because I got to God but it's because Jesus came to where I was lifted his hand out and drew me to God that's how you get in this morning thank you fellas I wonder have you ever come unto God by him y'all he ever liveth for me imagine the thought that God brother Jack the God man, God's son, that his whole purpose for living, for rising from the dead, would be just to reach out, Brother Zeke, and grab people like you so that you can have fellowship with God. And did you notice something else in your book? You still in Hebrews there? You ain't doodling. What are you drawing pictures for? Praise God, son. <laughs> Look at your book, verse 25. Watch this. You, you say this. You sitting here this morning, you say, but preacher, I hear what you're saying. And I appreciate what you're saying, but preacher, coming to God by Jesus, he wouldn't want me. I, I, even the Lord Jesus would have nothing to do with me. Oh, you'd be wrong. There's a word here used in the text that I just absolutely love. Brother David, watch this word, verse 25. Wherefore, he is able. I'm not able. He is. He is able also to save them. Watch it. Watch these next three words. To the. I love that word. Uttermost. You know what you'll find if you do a, a Bible word search on the word uttermost? This is what you find. Everywhere that it is used from the start of the Old Testament all the way through the book. This is the way it's always used, Brother Heath. It's always used like this. The outermost furthest edge of something the first time it's used it talks about the tabernacle and it talks about putting loops in the uttermost edge of the curtain the farthest point there are times it talks about the borders of Israel and it says this certain tribe brother Chad they were in the uttermost part of a certain region in other words they were the farthest point What's God telling us in this text? He's telling us this. It don't matter if 
you're a pretty clean living person and you ain't too far out. Or if you are the most vile sinner and you are way out. You say, preacher, I'm way out. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've participated in. You don't know where I've been. I could never get to God even through Jesus because I'm one of them uttermost people. I just read to you where it said those are the kind that he saves this morning. I'm telling you there ain't nobody. You say that ain't good English. No, but it's good theology this morning. Brother Lance, there ain't nobody that is so far out there in the weeds of sin. There ain't nobody so far on the edges and the borders of the life of sin that the Lord Jesus can't reach why? Why? I'm telling you there's no limit. There's no limit to the grace of God. There's no limit to the mercy of God. The Lord's arm is not shortened that it cannot save and his ears not heavy that it can't hear. I don't care how far out you are. God can reach to where you are. Grab a hold of your life and save you this morning. My Redeemer liveth to do that. (laughs) I'm saved to the uttermost and I know that I am. I've been washed in the blood of the precious Lamb through the Father, through the Son, Through the Holy Ghost I'm saved To the uttermost You must be forgiven To make heaven your home This good life you're living Won't do it alone So trust in my Savior He'll save you today And with blessed assurance You too can say That I'm saved to the uttermost I know that I am I've been washed in the blood Of the precious Lamb Here it is y'all Through the Father Through the Son Through the Holy Ghost I'm saved to the uttermost. Amen. The farthest edges, he's able. You say, how do you know? Because I know some pretty edgy people that the Lord reached. Way out there. I mean, I'm hung up here. I'm trying to get to my last two points. Honest to goodness, I am. But I'm having too good a time. I'm telling you, I know some people that before they got saved, they'd have thought, shoot, you won't never catch me in a dress sitting at church, singing them hymns, raising my hand, worshiping God. Oh, no. 730? On a Sunday morning? (laughs) Baby, I ain't even got over my hangover yet. About 7.30 in the morning is when I got my annual Sunday morning appointment with the toilet to throw my guts up from the party I was involved in the night before. Can I get an amen? No, ain't no way you'd ever catch me teaching a Sunday school class. Ain't no way you'd ever catch me singing in a choir. Ain't no way you'd ever catch me sitting in a church listening to the little stubby redneck from South Georgia up there screaming his guts out about being saved to the uttermost and like it. No, no. But y'all, <laughs> something happened. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Forgive me. That was wrong terminology. Someone happened. Yeah. And he reached way out. He reached way down. He reached way across. And here you said this morning, and the only way you can explain it is, I've been saved to the uttermost. Uh, He come got me way out there. And look what God has done. He ever liveth for you this morning.
Jordan. You know what he's alive for? He's alive to save you. Come to him now. What are you waiting on? There he sits. He's at the right hand of the Father saying, man, if you'll just come to me, call on the Lord Jesus Christ, I'll put you in good with my daddy. I know the judge of heaven. I'm in good with him. I have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. My Redeemer liveth for me. Can I show you something else? Look at Galatians chapter 2. Go back to the left from Hebrews just a little bit to Galatians chapter 2. I'm going to just give you this last couple and we're going to just be done. Most of my messages are like baloney anyways. Praise God. You can cut it anywhere. It all tastes the same. Amen. (laughs) 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 Hallelujah. I like a good fried baloney sandwich. Praise God. (laughs) Amen. Matter of fact, I'm hungry. I didn't eat much breakfast. Let's go home right now. Amen. I'm kidding. My wife ain't fixing me no fried bologna sandwich. You ain't, are you? Okay. Praise God. Just making sure. Not there's anything wrong with that. I know Brother Dan, he's going to be eating cold spam for a long time right now. Praise God. After that shooting yesterday, he done got way in deep. <laughs> My Redeemer liveth for me, but let me say this. Come to Galatians 2. Look at verse number 20. Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Watch it, watch it. Yet not I, but Christ, our word, liveth. Job said, I know he liveth. Liveth. Not just for me. Watch here. In me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. My Redeemer doesn't just live for me, but my Redeemer liveth. You want to know what the awesome part about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is? You say, yeah, it said he, he got up and defeated principalities and powers and, and rulers of darkness of this world and got the keys of death and hell like they sung about and, and took the blood back to the mercy seat and sat down to the right hand of the throne of majesty on high. Oh, that's awesome. That's, that's true. That's all awesome stuff. But I'll tell you, Brother Jacob, what's more awesome than all that? You say what's more awesome than all that is the fact that because he got up and he rose from the dead, that means he is able through the person of his spirit to live Y'all, I ain't nothing and nobody. I'm just an old dirty sinner, Lord, or to let go to hell without God. But he interceded for me and he saved me. When I came to God by him, I got saved. But he didn't just leave me to myself. He put the spirit of his son. Something took up residence in my life. Y'all listen to me. Listen to me. If ain't nothing ever took up residence in your life, you ain't saved. There is no salvation except the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, except He moves inside of you. I have something that old Job didn't have. Poor old Job over there, he's going through all that trouble, Brother Collins. He's going through all that trouble and trials. You know what he ain't got that I got? He ain't got the Holy Spirit of God living on the inside of him. I do. Y'all listen to me this morning. Paul, Paul said, I'm, I'm living this life. And I live it because he lives in me. Back in chapter 1 of Galatians, he ends up talking about how he used to murder Christians and persecute them. I talked a little bit about this in the early service. How is it possible for a man like Paul to go from killing Christians and enjoying it to being a Christian and enjoying it? (laughs) That don't make no sense. How in the world? You go from killing Christians and enjoying it to Brother Keith Haynes being a Christian and enjoying it. That just don't make no sense to me. That'd be like me being a Georgia Bulldog fan. No, let me back that up because I want to put the, I want to put the good one last and the bad one first. That'd be like me being a Florida Gator. Ooh. Y'all excuse me, I almost threw up my mouth. That'd be like me 
being a Florida Gator fan and loving it, and all of a sudden turn around and becoming a Georgia Bulldog fan and loving it. Now I'm proud. I'm a Bulldog born, Bulldog bred, and when I die, I'll be Bulldog dead. Say amen right there. <laughs> That's exactly right. How, how, you, you just can't swap like that. You just can't be. That just, that just don't make no sense. But that's what happened to Paul. Killing Christians, loving the hound out of it. Being a Christian, loving the hound out of it. How? He didn't do that on his own, y'all. Somebody's got to move in. Somebody's got to move in. I want y'all to understand something. These people in here enjoying this stuff, this preacher up here enjoying what I'm preaching this morning, this ain't us. We don't get the glory for none of this. We don't, we don't poke our chest out and say, boy, we turned our life around. Boy, we pulled ourselves up by our own bootstraps. And man we, 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 man, we learned enough and worked enough. No, sir. You know who gets the glory for all this? Not I, but Christ. Not I, but Christ. It's not us. It's Jesus living in us. And my Savior didn't just live for me, but he lives in me this morning I I would be curious to know this and I'm done I would be curious to know this does Jesus live inside of you you say well I don't know know about all that I'm just curious do you have an inclination of any sort or desire for the things of God you know what I'm preaching this morning Here's, here's a good acid test what the choir is saying this morning, what I'm preaching this morning, what we're saying by congregation this morning, was there anything inside of you that bore witness with that? That in your soul it said, "Mm, yes, glory. I mean, you don't have to worship like me. I ain't saying that. I'm glad everybody, you know, the Lord does things. But I mean, something inside of you just said, yes, I, I know what that's like. I know what being saved is. I know what being a child of God is. Oh, thank God I have that deep settled peace in my soul. Listen to me. If you don't have that, you ain't saved this morning. The Bible said the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. There's the wit- They used to preach on that. The old timers used to preach on the witness of the Holy Ghost. The witness of the Spirit. That if you had the Holy Ghost on the inside, there was a witness there. You know why I like this crowd? There's a witness between us, Brother Xander. There's a, I can go places and never have met people before. I'm, I'm trying to back up and not be gone near as much as I was. And I'm enjoying the mess out of that. But I, for years, I run all over this country preaching in all kinds of churches and all kinds of places. I mean, the independent Baptist churches and preaching King James Bible. And I'm, man, Brother Kevin, I mean, I'm just preaching everywhere. And I'd walk in these places and never met these people before in my life. And something would just say, Man, I, I know them. They know like something kindred. Some of y'all walk in here, ain't never seen y'all from Adam's house cat. But something in your spirit and my spirit, it bears witness, Brother Tim. What is that? It's the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about do you have him living in you this morning? If you say, preacher, I don't, I, I, I don't think the Lord lives in me. I don't have a desire for the things of God. I don't have a walk with God. I don't have the peace of God and the joy. Nothing, nothing in my soul reflects that Jesus moved in. This morning I would come to God by him. He liveth in me. My Redeemer liveth for me. Can I show you one more and we're done? Go with me to the book of the Revelation and we're done. The book of the Revelation. Not only is my Redeemer liveth for me, my Redeemer liveth in me. But look at Revelation chapter number 5. Revelation chapter 5. I, I wanted to show you what I'm about to show you. I wanted to show it to you. It's in chapter 1, but I'll not take the time to do it. I wanted to show it to you two times in chapter 4, but I'll not take the time to do it. I'll just show it to you one time in chapter 5. And verse number 11, chapter 5, verse 11. The saints of God just saying about being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And the Bible says in Revelation 5, 11, I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, the beasts and the elders. 
And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Up till this point in verse 12, it just says he was slain. Does that mean he's dead? Nope. Keep reading verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Here you go verse 14. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him. He wasn't just slain. He's alive. Worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. My Redeemer liveth for me. My Redeemer liveth in me. And lastly, my Redeemer liveth forever with me. You know what you were reading in chapter 5? You're reading about the blood-washed crowd living forever and ever with the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. The one who died on the cross. The one who got up three days later. I'm going to live forever with him. Y'all, listen to me. If that don't do something down in your soul, I'd wonder if I was even saved. I don't know. I don't know how we can sing a song like we sung Thursday night, Brother Jack. Love that song we sung Thursday night. One of my all-time favorite hymns. We don't sing it much, but I like it. Old sister Fanny Crosby. Brother Noah, blind gal. Never seen the light of day. Old sister Fanny Crosby wrote that song. I shall know him. I shall know him by the print of the nails in his hand. Old sister Fanny Crosby said, when my life's work is ended and I've crossed the swelling tide and the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side and his smile will be the first to welcome me and I shall know him, I shall know him. And we sing something like that. And then all of a sudden we roll into And what a day that will be When my Jesus I shall see When I look upon his face The one who saved me by his grace When he takes me by the hand And leads me through the promised land What a day, glorious day Brother JC, we sing that stuff And my soul starts turning cartwheels Brother, I'm telling you My body just feels like Let's get raptured right now You say why? Because I want to see him Because I'm looking forward to spending eternity with him. I I thank God that I'm going to get to spend eternity with my beautiful bride. Oh, she's saved and I'm saved and we're going to get to spend eternity together. Boy, it blesses my soul. I tell you, I've been writing these Bibles for my kids. Uh, Not like writing a Bible, but making notes in a Bible. I've been writing a Bible. How messed up would that be if I wrote a Bible? Praise God. You couldn't even hardly read it. (laughs) Anyway, I've been making notes in Bible to give to my children and done two of them so far and man when I reach the end of them Bibles and I start reading about the city of God I just get so joyful in my spirit knowing I'm going to get to spend eternity in a place like that with Esther and with Abigail and with Cody and with Charity my whole family's going to heaven we're going to walk hand in hand down a street of gold live in a mansion hear an angel choir son I get excited but y'all more than any of that more than any of that more than spending eternity with my youngins more than spending eternity with my loved ones going on I am so excited brother Ivy that one day I will get to spend eternity with the friend that sticketh closer than a brother the lily of the valley the bright morning star the rose of Sharon the one I've sung about the one I've preached about the one I've worshipped the one that saved me the one that lives inside of me I'm going to get to see him and spend the ceaseless ages of eternity with Jesus man that does something for me and I'm curious this morning I'm done Esther help me up here I'm I'm curious are you going to spend eternity with the rest of us Have you ever experienced that he liveth for you so that he could live in you? And are you going to experience with us living forever him with you 
Mm. I'm telling you, I was reading one time years ago an old book that I've got in the office somewhere. And Brother Skip, I was reading about an old preacher of yesteryear, great man of God, R.G. Lee, preached that old famous message, payday someday. Famous message, Brother Dwayne, he preached it thousands of times about Ahab and Jezebel and preached payday someday. He pastored the Belmont Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. His son-in-law was the late, great Southern Baptist preacher Adrian Rogers, who took over for him after he died. Oh, R.G. Lee, Brother Holshauser, was sitting on the front porch one day with his mother out in the country. Little old simple country folk. He said, I was sitting there, Brother Clayton, on the front porch, and my mind was just working like a child's mind would work. He said, and I looked at my mama, and I said, Mama, what was the happiest day of your life? He said, Mama was sitting there shelling peas or snap beans or something. Said, and she just put it down, just sat there for a minute, and she looked off down the driveway, and she said, You know, son, I've never told you this before. She said, but when I was a little girl about your age, she said, my daddy, your papa, went off to the wars between the states. Said he went to fight for his country and went off to the wars between the states and fight for liberty. And she said, sometime after he had left, Brother Zeke said, we got a telegram that said daddy had died. She's telling little R.G. Lee this, and she said, uh, she said, Robert, the saddest day of my life was when we got the news. Daddy was dead. And Robert sat there and thought, I thought she was going to tell me about the happiest day. She said, they told us he was dead, and I remember watching my mama go to her room and cry and cry and cry, thinking that her husband would never come home. She said, I remember, Brother Will, laying in my bed at night in that little old shotgun of a house and hear my mama after she'd put us to bed cry herself to sleep night after night because her husband wasn't ever coming home she said but one day we was a sitting on the front porch just like you and I are now she said I was sitting there playing and mama was doing something on the front porch and she said mama got this far away look in her eye down the driveway and my mama's eyes fixed on this little old figure that was walking down by the split rail dirt road fence coming way off in the distance over through the cornfields and she said mama looked up and said honey that man sure does look a whole lot like your daddy she said, I looked at my mama and I said, Mama, you know that daddy's dead. You know daddy ain't coming back. They sent us the telegram, daddy's gone. She said, I know, you're right. Said a few minutes later, mama looked up again. And without hesitation, mama threw them beans off her lap, jumped off the front porch, let out a scream, and took off running. Said, I didn't know what had happened. Said, and I watched Mama run and jump into a one-armed man's chest and just hug him and hug him. And I, she said, we finally followed Mama down the driveway, and the closer we got, we seen it was Daddy. Said they had said Daddy died, but he didn't, Brother Hunter. He just got wounded, and they thought he was dead, but he weren't dead. She said, in the happiest day of my life was when my Daddy that they said was dead we found out he was alive and he came back to live with us for the rest of our life you say what's that got to do with us here we are resurrection Sunday <laughs> and this world has told us our Savior's dead and it's all a dream and it ain't real brother Donald Oh, but one, some, one day, some golden daybreak, Jesus will come. And the Bible's still true. And one day, heaven's going to part like a scroll. And the Savior's going to step out on a puffy white cloud. And He's going to call for His bride. And our Savior, the King of kings, the one who got up out of the grave, He's alive. He's going to come get us. And we're going to live with the Lord. Amen. He's alive. I know my Redeemer liveth. I know. I don't care what.
what the world says. I don't care what politicians say. I don't care what religion says. I know, I know, I know my Redeemer liveth this morning. And he's coming. And I can't help but think, I can't help but think that some of y'all don't know him. That he doesn't live in you. He'll save you if you'll come to God by him this morning. If you'd come and call on Jesus, that's why he lives. To save sinners like us. Child of God, say, preacher, my load is heavy. It was heavy for Job. But what helped him is he realized my Redeemer liveth. Maybe this morning you hit an altar child of God and say, Lord, thank you just for being alive. Thank you, Lord, that you still know where I'm at and what I'm going through. And you can help us. Let's all stand this morning. Father, thank you, Lord, for the Word of God that is so real. Thank you, Lord, for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who is able to save to the uttermost them that come unto God by Him, seeing He ever liveth to make intercession for us. Thank you for living in me. Thank you that one day I'm going to live forever with you. God, there be one here that's lost, that Jesus doesn't live in them. I pray they'd come this morning. In Jesus' name, heads are bowed.